Sarah, so good to see you. I'm sure you're going to be up watching the feed coming from NASA, but the expectations for this are, are almost at frenetic levels. They are. It's like something we haven't seen for quite some time, and it's just purely because of the span of land that this eclipse is covering. It's going to allow possibly the most people to see the eclipse in this decade that we're in because it is such a large expanse. And um, there's been lots of excitement about not only how beautiful it will be, but excitement around how we could use it to educate the public just in general about um, science. Yeah, and that's such a great point. I mean, first of all, we should say that this one is also that we're going to see various phases of an eclipse. Take us through what what we could expect. That's right. So depending on where you are in that line of totality, you will either see a partial or a total solar eclipse. And if you're in the area where you can see a total solar eclipse, you'll actually see the moon move in front of the sun across its journey in totality, which is pretty incredible. It lasts for a couple of hours. The totality itself is only a couple of minutes, but the transition between the moon moving across it is quite a wonderful thing to see. When you talk about what we can learn from a scientific point of view, yeah. what does the, a, an eclipse like this help us understand? What's quite exciting with uh, eclipses like this is because it's blocking out the majority of the sunlight, we're able to get a really great view of the edges of the sun. You might hear it called the ring of fire. And what's quite interesting and quite exciting is this year we're in a solar maximum, meaning that we have more solar activity than most years. We have more solar flares and more coronal mass ejection. So there's a possibility of seeing some more prominences and some more features that we wouldn't otherwise unless it was a year like this one. And so what can we learn about the sun then if we can see more of that outer ring of fire as you say? Yeah, so there's a few different things. Some solar physicists will try and understand how being in a solar maximum affects the prominences and the solar flares that we're able to see. And just the structure of the, the, the outer ring that we see as well, comparing it to previous eclipses. So there's a few different things that we can learn. But just as the general public, if you're looking through either a pinhole camera or a solar telescope, you're able to learn a few different features on the sun and then tie that back into the physics of what is actually happening within our sun. Yeah, interesting. How I mean, these are not very common, these total solar eclipses, are they? So a total solar eclipse happens approximately every 18 months or so, but the problem is it doesn't always happen over land. The majority of our Earth is ocean, is water, meaning that we're very lucky when we get a totality path, especially like the one that you're seeing um, t today, tonight, where it is covering a vast amount of the land. So that is quite rare in itself. Yeah. There was another particularly spectacular sight in parts of the US last week when a big piece of spiny, sp Chinese space junk crashed to Earth. Yes. Um, this is going to be an ongoing issue given there is so much up there now in space. It is, it is. And this particular piece of space junk created a remarkable debris field that was burning up over Southern California. Um, many people were confused and a little bit worried about what they were seeing, which you would be if you didn't understand what was happening. It looks like meteors on, on the nth level. And what's quite concerning about this is that it's just one of many of these large scale debris burn ups that we're seeing in the past couple of years. And it's one um, that we're going to see more of as we enter the era where we're launching more satellites than ever before each year to space, whether they be public or commercial, we're going to see more of them coming down as uh, some recommendations are changing for how long satellites can actually stay up in uh, something we call low Earth orbit. And the recommendation is that they should come down every five years, meaning that in a decade or so, we will likely be seeing a satellite burn up at least every day. Wow, that's extraordinary. And they will always burn up in the atmosphere. It's not likely that they're going to crash somewhere on Earth. So that's a fantastic question because the answer is uh, quite complicated. So not always. Sometimes they might burn up completely in the atmosphere. That's not a given, though, depending on the materials that they are made out of. And uh, here in Australia, we've been particularly, um, I won't say the word lucky, but we've We've had a lot of occurrences where we've had debris land, uh, not only in uh, our inland Australia, there was that debris piece in New South Wales last year, I believe, but also wash up on our shores. And so it's something that is a non-zero chance of happening. OK. Why is there this move for the standard lunar time? 
This is a really uh, interesting thing. So we have standard times around uh, the world. We we connect all of our clocks to uh, a standard time and we have atomic clocks to help us keep track of what time it is. Um, but on the moon, it's a little bit more complicated. So the moon's time actually ticks a little bit differently than our time here on Earth because it has less of a gravitational um, Cool. So seconds are slightly faster on the moon, ever so slightly. It's about 0.02 seconds a year faster. But that is, again, a non-zero number when you're trying to do autonomous maneuvers and have everything um, computer programmed and oriented on the moon. So having a standard time, uh, which will involve having atomic clocks likely on the surface of the moon and in orbit, will be required for us keeping accurate timekeeping for when we send humans back to the moon and also autonomous systems. Yeah, so those little milliseconds could actually make a big difference in terms of the accuracy. Absolutely, yes, and especially when you've got, say, people down on the moon, you want uh, as as big an accuracy as you can, especially because these next missions, uh, part of the uh, Artemis program, are likely going to be exploring further than we saw uh, in the previous Apollo generation. Yep. Tell us, are, are you surprised by how, how well Japan's lunar lander is still going, considering it had a really patchy start? I am. I am. An, I feel a little bit proud, honestly, because when <laughs> it first went into <laughs> to lunar dark, um, for context, this mission was only designed to last uh, a one lunar day, which is about two Earth weeks. It wasn't designed to survive uh, the lunar night, which is exceptionally cold. Um, and this particular lander, normally if you're trying to get a lander to survive uh, lunar night or the cold vastness of space, you have uh, nuclear systems on board to try and heat things up because we know if you make things too cold, our electronics don't like it. This system didn't have any of that and it was not particularly designed. So it is amazing that not only did it last one uh, lunar night, it's lasted two and it does have the potential to, uh, to keep surprising us as weeks go on. That's fabulous. Well, you have a wonderful night if you're staying up. I think we're all going to be looking looking out to see sort of all the images that come. I'm sure we're going to see them for days. Thanks so much for joining us, Sarah. Thank you for having me.